Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome to the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. And wouldn't you know it, yeah, stuff's breaking. This is great. So everyone, uh, welcome into the program. So we're going to work on our live video feed, but we, of course, have this whole thing recorded. So uh, yeah, people watching this after the fact, there will be no interruption and the archives will be complete. So we're just going to run with it while we uh, you know, work on these things here in the background. So with that being said, everyone, hey, welcome into the Computer America Show. Let's go ahead and switch this over here. I hope that you're doing well and you are ready for today's program. So today on the show, we have the one, the only Mr. Ralph Bond. He is joining us here in just a moment where he will be, of course, uh, you know, talking science and tech trends, all the latest stories, you know, stories that you may have missed. I certainly did. If you hadn't noticed, uh, yeah, we have been uh, doing Best of Computer Americas for the past five days. I actually had to, uh, you know, drive a car across the country and uh, had to drop that off. But yep, got to see Colorado for the first time, the Rockies, all that good stuff and uh the uh no offense to anyone who lives there or uh probably high offense uh kentucky oh my god i drove through like seven states kentucky wins the worst uh all the others were you know they were okay but kentucky holy cow uh the potholes of south carolina and the roadkill of tennessee and all in one spectacular place now with that being said though uh, enough picking on kentucky uh everyone hey welcome back into the program we hope that you missed us because hey we sure missed you so everyone let's go ahead and uh and you know hey continue on here with the program so let's go ahead bring on ralph and uh and by the way he does not share my views i'm sure but everyone hey welcome on to the program once again ralph bond he has of course been with computer america for a long time voice of uh our our, our well, uh, Intel Digital Mint back in the day, as well as author in his own right, and hey, correspondent now for Computer America. Ralph, how you doing? Right, yeah, I've spent some time in Tennessee, not much in Kentucky, and uh, only in the major urban areas. So I guess I didn't get to experience the true road conditions of either state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, well, and uh, it, it, you know, and I, I think I'm Kentucky a little bit. I was only there for a couple of hours. Uh, the whole drive, though, it, it was about a 21 hour drive. I did it in two days. Um, and, and I, uh, not to brag, but I could have done it in one day. But, you know, there's really no point in doing that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but it was fun. Got to see Colorado. And, Ralph, wouldn't you know it? Uh, we made it. Uh, yeah, I had like a little vacation there. But, yeah, uh, two days after a blizzard and two days before we left, there was oh. another blizzard coming. So, I'm sure mm. that this weekend, I, uh, my brother lives out there, and he said that uh, they're talking feet of snow, not inches mm. of snow. Mm. So Yeah, well, Colorado is famous. The old line about Colorado is, if you don't like the weather, wait 30 minutes. There you go. It's uh, very, very <laughs> chaotic there, but it was gorgeous while we were there, and I had a lot of fun. But, uh, Ralph, how you been? How, how was last month I'm for you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Hey, I'm going to get my uh, COVID vaccine tomorrow. Yay! <laughs> very cool. Yeah, that's... Uh, and, you know, I'm sure that a lot of people will be experiencing the same thing, because, yeah. uh, man, that's super important, and... Uh, back, last I checked, we were up to like 2 million doses a day being administered. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's really cranking up. And we're, my wife and I are going to get the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So that's interesting how fast they've been able to ramp that up is just beyond my understanding. It is crazy. <laughs> Uh, you know, and not to turn this into, you know, kind of the COVID vaccine talk hour, but uh, the Johnson <laughs> Johnson one, that that's the one that has like a 70% uh, effectiveness rate, like if I I'm not mistaken. Like upper 60s, 68-ish yeah. or something like that. But the upswing of it is one dose, regular refrigeration. Mm -hmm. That's another a valuable part of it in terms of getting it out to the population. And uh, a, a very strong performance rate if you unfortunately get the COVID-19, apparently the Johnson & Johnson vaccine pretty much guarantees you're not going to have to have hospitalization or uh, resulting death. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'm good with it. Works yeah. for me. 
Yeah, and and you know that's why I, that's what I had heard as well is that uh, you know even though the effectiveness rate is you know so much lower than the others when it comes to like you said severe hospitalization you know being on respirators and things like that right. the stuff that you really want to avoid because you know yeah I'm right. sure that you want to avoid you know kind of flu like effects and symptoms uh, right. not dying is probably very important and it's just as effective me. yes it, well, it yeah. works for me too and not mm-hmm. and not to labor the point too much but one more thing. Even after I'm vaccinated and my wife and I are vaccinated, and even after the period of time when we're quote unquote safe, still going to be doing the masks, still going to be doing the sanitizing, being careful, social distancing, all of that kind of stuff. That's not going to stop for us. And probably, gosh, I don't know, who knows how long that'll have to go on. We'll see. I, you know, there's so much of our new lifestyles that I really do mm-hmm. hope that we kind of uh, carry with us, even after COVID mm-hmm. is, you know, just a note in the history books. Uh, I, I hope that, you know, for seasonal flu and people being sick and like, if you know yeah. that you're sick, wearing masks and sanitizing and, you know, yep. making sure that all that's, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we can take the good from, you know, kind of all the preparedness we've done and the infrastructure that we've built and, you know, some yep. good can come out of all this. I agree. Yeah. 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 I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that that comes through uh, everyone. But hey, like I said, we're not here to talk about COVID or I mean, <laughs> hey, maybe we are because a couple of these stories <laughs> I'm sure are going to be COVID related. So <laughs> with that being said, Ralph, though, before we get started, why don't you go ahead and tell the nice folks, uh, you know, just generally, hey, what uh, what attracts you to the stories that we're going to talk about today? Exactly. Well, it's a point you raised earlier, stories that you may not have heard about. These are stories, uh, science and technology stories, that sort of fly under the mainstream media radar, but they're often very, very significant. And so what I do is I kind of troll the all the news services and so forth and cherry pick out stories that I think are are fun and interesting. And again, that you may not have had a chance to hear of. And the first story today is very kind of, I, I live in Oregon. I live in Hillsborough, Oregon, very close to the world's largest semiconductor plant and that's Ron or acres and and uh, so forth with Intel Corporation where I used to work for almost 14 years anyway it's an Oregonian story but I think it has a wide appeal and let's get into that the headline is federal lease allows Oregon State University's offshore wave energy testing facility to move ahead in 2021 if you've got the show notes on the screen if you're happy to be participating with your computer or or after the fact please get the show notes so you can see what we're talking about and find all the links to these stories this is kind of fun so again i i confess it's an oregonian story but with i think larger implications so oregon Mm -hmm. state university is planning to build a large scale ocean wave energy testing facility and last month the federal bureau of ocean energy management awarded the university a lease to operate in federal waters about seven miles offshore southwest of Newport, Oregon, and you can get out your map and find out where that is. Now, the PAC wave, that's P-A-C for Pacific Wave, run together, ocean test site will be located on an area of the Pacific Ocean away from popular commercial and recreation uh, fishing reefs and areas, so that's important. And the offshore installation will include up to 20 electricity-generating wave energy converters that work by harnessing the up-and-down motion of ocean waves. That's the fundamental premise. There'll be five power and data cables buried below the seafloor, ranging from 50,000 to 66,000 feet in length, and that will connect the wave energy converters offshore to a facility onshore uh, southeast of Seal Rock. And again, Oregonians know where mm-hmm. this is, but you can get out your map and find that as well. The offshore test site will also include tidal and current energy converters, as well as ocean thermal energy conversion technology. This is an important point. So it's three different forms of wave, if you will, or ocean energy uh, harvesting. So a tidal or current energy converter is a machine that extracts energy from moving masses of water. And an ocean thermal energy converter uses the temperature difference between cooler deep and warmer surface water to run a heat engine to produce electricity, which is really kind of cool. And then why is this so important? Well, the World Energy Council estimates that 10%, let that sink in, 10% of the world's electricity needs could potentially be met by harvesting ocean energy. So all of these research efforts in this area are so extremely important. 
it's it's uh, not putting all your eggs in one basket, not just uh, you know not not right. just wind farms, not j- and by the way, uh, right. making that drive out there, Ralph. I am embarrassed to say it, but that was the first time I saw wind uh, you know kind of wind farms and uh, you know those giants. Uh, oh right, isn't that yeah. freaky? <laughs> they uh, and, and and like you have to keep telling yourself because you know obviously they're in the distance, they don't look that big, blah yes. blah blah. Uh, like each one of those blades is like sixty feet long or something like that. I know uh, they are oh, yeah. massive, and to every Everyone who says that they're eyesores, um, no, I, I I never really felt that at all. You know that they look ugly and ruin the thing. And no, it was uh, definitely cool. But yeah, not putting it all into wind energy, not right. putting it all into solar. Right. Um, I'm I'm curious how effective it is because you know Ralph, like you're saying this whole thing. I mean, they are essentially putting bobbers on the water, and I guess the up and down motion is you know mm-hmm. uh, as as well as the you know the uh, the temperature. I'm wondering how effective they are and how much, uh, you know, seven miles offshore, no regular person, you know, this, uh, you can see the diagram here on the bottom left or bottom right. Right. Uh, no one's right. going to be able to see it from the shore, but I'm wondering right. how, how effective it's going to be. Cool stuff. You're right. It is Oregon, but I think this is what uh, <laughs> anyone with a coastline is going to start, you know, seeing these, uh, these ideas start to pop up. Well, and here's another thing, you know, the recent tragedy in Texas, where there was so so much mm-hmm. talk about, well, uh, because of the terrible storm, the the wind, uh, the turbines couldn't fl- uh, fly, and the solar power was compromised. But the beauty part about the ocean waves is they don't stop. There's yeah, it. yeah, no, they, they, <laughs> they don't stop, uh, unless, of course, you know, parts of Canada where the whole thing freezes over. But I think as far well, as yeah, Oregon, okay. Washington are concerned, <laughs> not yes, yes. as much a concern. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, although I will say, uh, Oregon, Washington, you guys up there are very concerned with your wildlife. Uh, you know, these are just going to be you know simple cables. I'm sure that you know most wildlife will be able to avoid them easily. I'm curious right. if there's going to be any effect on that. But hey, that's uh, yeah. that's the point of these tests is to see yeah. if these things are viable. So exactly right. Yep. Yeah. There you <laughs> go. Uh, living with nature, very important, awesome to see. Now, story number two, and uh, Kenya, and usually when we hear about tech stories in Kenya, because Kenya is, uh, you know, not really a tech hub. It's not San Francisco or anything like that. But right. when it comes to sustainability, and like I said, living with nature and things like that, um, yeah, you know, you, you can always look to Africa because they are, they are truly dealing with, you know... Uh, I guess advances that we have, you know, we didn't really have to go through, Ralph. I mean, plastic wasn't a thing when America was being right. industrialized. Uh, right. So they're making the most out of it. And story number right. two, I think it really highlights that. Yeah, this story is fun on so many levels. So here's the headline. Woman in Kenya is making bricks out of plastic waste. This came from an a outfit called ecowatch.com. Great outlet, by the way, folks. Story by Savannah Hasty. So here's the scoop. Oh, and there's a video too, by the way. And in the mm-hmm. show notes, we have the link for that. Uh, so a woman named Nazambi Mate uh, is an entrepreneur in Nairobi, Kenya, who has developed a way to turn plastic waste into sustainable, strong paving bricks. Now, leveraging her background in materials engineering, her company, Jijenga Makers, and that's G G as in girl, G J. E-N-G-E, <laughs> makers, developed a brick made of recycled plastic chips and sand. So the, recy- the recycled plastic, of course, chopped up in little chip bits mixed with sand. And then the bricks are made by compressing and heating that mixture at a very high temperature. So it's really pretty straightforward. The result is a super strong, moldable, and sustainable alternative to concrete. That was her goal. The fibrous structure of the plastic makes the bricks seven times stronger than concrete and, of course, much more lightweight. And the company's current product line includes pavers for residential and commercial uses. And, for example, the heavy-duty two-and-a-half-inch thick paver is strong enough to be used for parking lots and even roads, while the one-and-a-quarter-inch thick light-duty paver, which, by the way, is available in a variety of colors, that's another benefit, can be used for home patios and walkways. So I just thought, how clever and how, anything, anything, and you and I are both know how horrible our, our solid waste problem is worldwide and the terrible texas size floating out in the pacific nasty mm-hmm. floating plastic garbage out there if we can figure out some way to harvest this material transform it into building materials that are stronger than concrete and lighter wow 
I just thought this was a cool story. Um, and and for anyone who has followed, you know, kind of uh, uh, carbon emissions, I mean, uh, sequestering mm-hmm. is a big word there and, you know, finding a way to mm-hmm. kind of capture and kind of keep these things in place. Uh, I've seen a lot of reuses, Ralph, over the past couple of years for, you know, kind of like recycled plastic. And I got to say, a lot of them. Uh, I'm not really fond of, you know, things like uh, recycled mm-hmm. plastic clothing and, and things like that, because mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. My, microplastics, mm-hmm. you know, uh, that's mm-hmm. a topic mm-hmm. that comes up. They'll give off microplastics, but I would say bricks on roadways and things like that. I mean, are you know, pathways. It's a pretty good way to sequester. And the fact that they're mixing it with sand is just another added, you know, kind of way to make sure that it, uh, it all stays where, where it, uh, you know, where you put it. Uh, very cool idea. I think in the uh, little video there, she said that she can make about 1,500 bricks a day. And mm-hmm. I think that's really amazing that, you know, turning what is essentially trash to everyone else, trash yeah. and sand into 1,500 bricks of usable material, that is a huge accomplishment. And honestly, isn't you know, that cool? Looking at what you get out of it, you know, <laughs> with the different colors and things like that, yeah. um, looks very nice as well. So. It's very cool. And by the way, I even sent them an email. I haven't heard back yet, but I said, hey, you know what, guys? Bricks are great and go go keep doing that. But, you know, what if you could make roofing tiles out of this material, right? So suddenly you have uh, lightweight, but extremely strong colors, different colors, Mm -hmm. roofing tiles, like the Spanish curved tile type concept, right? Wow. It'd be very weather tolerant, very durable, and attractive. So I hope maybe they'll uh, consider that idea. I think it'd be super cool. Yeah, I'm sure that the applications are, you know, really, uh, you know, really out there. Rob, I, I got to say that uh, right now they have like these smaller bricks that they're kind of doing these patterns mm-hmm. with. I'm sure that mm-hmm. uh, maybe even their next step would be different size and, and, and whatnot. Sure. Uh, but it is lightweight. So, you know, they could definitely do that. Very cool story. And fun by, story. Yeah. I, I definitely didn't hear about that. So good job, Ralph. That's a <laughs> very good one. Story number three. And hey, um, yeah. COVID 19. Here, here it comes. There it is. Here it comes. So, headline here. This is this one. I mean, this is a good example of the stories that just bong catch my eye. And I say, wait a minute. <laughs> so, the headline is some Neanderthal genes in people may help prevent severe COVID-19. Comes from sciencenews.org, story by Tina Hessman Say, S-A-E-Y is her last name. Got the picture and the link, of course, in the show notes. Now, here we go. Some genetic variants inherited from Neanderthals may protect against developing severe COVID-19, according to a new report from the National Academy of Sciences, Wow. The recent study looked at a section of DNA on chromosome 12, where a halotype that affects susceptibility to the coronavirus is located. So this is DNA geekiness here for a moment. But here's a couple of science reminders. Chromosome 12 is one of the 23 pairs of chromosomes in humans. And a halotype is a cluster of genetic variants that are inherited together. For each copy of the, of the Neanderthal halotype a person inherits, the risk of needing intensive care fell approximately 22%. Mm. Ha! Huh. And then this is interesting. It's estimated that about 25 to 30% of people of Asian and European ancestry carry the protective variants. And my wife is quite concerned b- based on my behavior and intelligence level that I definitely must have the Neanderthal <laughs> holotype in my uh, DNA string. So <laughs> there you go. isn't that interesting? It, kind of fascinating. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, there are some great documentaries about uh, Neanderthal. And by the way, I had to look oh. that up. Uh, Neanderthal is, you know, uh, T instead of TH is yeah. favored by scientific journals and Neanderthal. Yeah, I, I always did the TH. You're, you're right on target. I had to train myself to say yeah. Neanderthal. <laughs> yeah, Neanderthal is more of like a layman's com- common kind of thing. So, but it uh, sounds better. <laughs> both of them are correct, Ralph. So we can keep doing. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, good. 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 Yeah, yeah. There you go. But uh, yeah, and and you know, there's a lot of documentaries about you know kind of who uh, who uh, inherited these genes, things like that. Yeah. Uh, places like uh, you know 23 and Me and Ancestry.com. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mm-hmm. everyone who does mm-hmm. DNA tests. Uh, they're starting to kind of tell people, you know, how much Neanderthal do you have in your lineage? Uh, 
it, it's very cool. And I mean, this is the point of genetics. Variances build defenses. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. that's uh, a very important part of why we're still here. Uh, yep. I had no idea that, hey, you know, gifts from thousands and thousands of years ago could protect you from things today. So I'm just I'm just glad our ancestors got it on with them. <laughs> hey, absolutely. Hey, and, and really that that is, uh, you know, uh, in my lifetime, that's been the change, thinking that we kind of outcompeted, we killed them, we, you know, uh, we were just better than Neanderthals. I think it no. was come together, as the Beatles would say. <laughs> Turns out we loved them very much. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, kind of the, the end result is what we have today. And Yay. yeah, there you go. So everyone, uh, COVID-19, we're still learning a lot about this. And hey, this is, I'm, this whole line, Ralph, I think also is going to lend credence to future research into, mm-hmm. hey, you know, uh, why, you know, what populations need to be, let's say, va- right. you know, vaccinated first as opposed to others and, you know, high risk exactly. type, one more risk type. Yeah. So there you go. So right. there you go. Story number three. Great, uh, you know, classic, I would even say get it old Uh whatever okay so story number four though story number four (laughs) and i gotta say that uh, i am you know being out amongst the country ralph i have seen like lately as many amazon trucks as i have like fedex and ups they are really ramping up their their vans and their deliveries so this is a really cool part here story number four it is and this one's uh, headline is amazon's electric rivian vans will start making deliveries as early as 2022. Two sources for this story, Motor Motor Trend, a story by Frank Marcus, and The Verge, a story by Andrew Hawkins. So I've got all the links again and pictures and all this good stuff in the show notes and a video too. So here we go. Amazon recently commissioned Rivian, and if you're not able to see the screen, it's R-I-V-I-A-N, to produce 100 thousand electric delivery vans by 2030 let that sink in the first 10,000 hitting the road by the end of 2022 so it's not the 100,000 all at once right of course uh, rivian is developing three vans capable of carrying 500 700 or 900 cubic feet of packages all the vans will come with state-of-the-art technology gee no surprise including exterior cameras linked to a digital display inside the cabin giving the driver a 360 degree view of the outside of the vehicle that's very cool the vans will also come integrated with amazon's alexa gee no surprise voice assistant for hands-free navigation help and weather updates rivian is a relatively new name in the electric vehicle industry, having only debuted its pickup truck and SUV at the end of November 2018. However, last year, Rivian was able to secure enormous investments from a host of major players, including, of course, Amazon. So this is sort of a self-feeding thing in a sense that Amazon invests in Rivian, and then they're going to have Rivian make a bunch of these vans for you. But um, (laughs) my daughter was saying the other day to me, I just feel like there's this unbelievable, inevitable wave of pushing more and more to all electric vehicles. I hear it from my friends. I see it in what my friends are buying. And it just just feels, I really now feel like by 2030, electric vehicles will be probably more sold than the gas ones. Maybe not, but I just feel like that. I don't know how you feel about it. Well, it feels like, well, and and I got to say that, uh, you know, certain, certain, uh, economies or certain markets really kind of push this kind of thing. Uh, Europe, I believe, said with uh, you know the Paris Climate Accord and you know things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Twenty thirty five, mm-hmm. I believe, for Europe, mm-hmm. and I think California set theirs at twenty thirty. So mm-hmm. your uh, mm-hmm. your prediction, I mean, those trends that you're seeing are definitely happening, and then of course they are mandated by policy changes uh, in right. you know in other parts of the world. So right, uh, right. But that's not a bad thing at all. And I've even heard some people say that you know producing these things are worse for the environment than traditional coal burning things like that. Um, mm. Certainly not the case. Not the case at all. And hey, it's just the future, you know. Uh, there's not really much a combustion engine can do better than electric vehicle with the proper infrastructure. Right. And right. you know, um, Amazon doing this, I'm I'm happy. And by the way, you know, uh, you know, I was look, kind of looking at my phone, and it's because I think I think I think I think I have pictures mm. of Rivian at CES. Um, 
Oh, I yeah. think it was this one. And I mean, the green screen is probably going to play uh, oh, crazy yeah. on, my, on my thing here. But I think that's the Rivian uh, SUV that they were debuting there oh, at CES cool. uh, 2019. It was great to yeah, see them out there. I mean, they, they're they really rugged. And, uh, you know, they were definitely cool to see. So not often, Ralph, do you get a new car company. I, I've said this on the show before where, you know, for Tesla, it took a literal billionaire with lots of investors, a good track record, infinite free press, and more to get Tesla off the ground. Mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. I'm I'm amazed any car company can make it. Uh, you know, in today's day and age, you know, uh, looking yeah. at how hard it is to start a car company. But you got everyone's, it right. But everyone seems to love Rivian, and it's great to see that they're working with. Uh, with that Amazon, is cool. So. And you know, talking about this transition, my daughter was alluding to. Uh, mm-hmm. My wife and I right now are are very keenly interested in the Toyota Rav Four Prime. Which is the prime just kind of coming out of the market. Right? Yes. What's interesting about it though, Ben, for me it, as a transitional vehicle, and let me explain you can get in the car and drive for 40 miles purely electric and then transition to traditional hybrid mode if you're doing a longer journey. But mm-hmm. if you stop and think about my lifestyle, my wife and I, we barely ever drive 40 miles in a day since we're both retired, so to speak and hanging out at the home, especially in the COVID area, but even, even before the COVID thing, 40 miles, we could probably almost drive exclusively electric, except for maybe one or two days out of the week. And even then not that much. So what an interesting idea, I think that you would drive that amount of miles, purely Mm -hmm. electric, then switch to hybrid and have that opportunity to virtually almost be like an electric vehicle for all intents and purposes for regular day to day shopping around the town kind of stuff. Right. Well, and and I had to look that up because I think you know there's a very good reason that 40 number exists. Um, according to AAA, who I guess would know, uh, about 26 <laughs> miles a day for uh, the winter months and about 30 miles a day for the summer months. Uh, yeah, uh, and that is the average American will drive. There about you that go. Much. Uh, that's a great stat. Yeah. So and and of course that's. Uh, when my parents were looking at a new car, you know, for safety and reliability and the price mm-hmm, and all that mm-hmm. kind of thing, Ralph. I told them to get the RAV4. Uh, they didn't, oh, but uh, but, I, but I recommended the exact same thing with the whole Prime feature. Uh, oh, yeah. So I'm I'm hoping my next car is probably going to be that. So well, hey. if we want, if we're lucky enough to find one and get one, I'll let you know how it goes. We'll do a review. That, yeah, yeah, just do uh, try, try to find a buy one get one free. You know, just and just send uh, it on over. Yeah, That'd be great. Of course, That'd be good. <laughs> Perfect. So story number four, story number five, though this one from CNN. Yes. Uh, what is this one? This is really something. This comes from CNN, a story by Amy Woodyot. And the headline, this is what grabbed my attention. Forget fingerprints. Now, this is a little extreme. Artificial intelligence may soon use your veins to identify you, and specifically the veins on the back of your hand. So here's the story. It's kind of fun. As we all know today, of course, facial recognition, eye scanning, fingerprint and voice recognition technology is used for a wide range of security purposes. And, you know, a lot of cities are having a lot of cities and companies are having a lot of heartburn about facial recognition. But I think, you know, that we'll just leave Mm -hmm. that there for a second. But here's a scoop. But researchers from Australia's University of New South Wales say that some of these biometric ID methods have well-known weaknesses, of, of course. For example, fingerprints can be collected from a surface someone has touched and duplicated to create a dummy print to fool a system. Facial recognition technology could be bypassed by using images captured from social media posts. For example, we've heard about that. And con- this one was interesting, though. And contact lens. Lenses could be used to confound eye scanning based mechanisms. That sounds very James Bondish to me. But according to the researchers, vein patterns on the back of your hands offer advantages. For example, they do not leave any imprint, unlike fingerprints. So if I touch the back of my hand on some surface, you're not going to be able to lift the pattern. The hand vein scanning system the New Wales University team developed uses a low cost, this is fun, a low cost Intel. RealSense D415, D415 depth camera, 
which is widely available. You can go on Amazon and get it for about 150 bucks. Using artificial intelligence and the camera, researchers extracted discriminating features from the vein patterns on the back of 35 test participants' hands. And they claim they could identify an individual with more than 99% accuracy. Now, the idea of using hand veins to identify people is not new. So truth and lending disclaimer here for a moment. But to date, it has required highly specialized and very expensive technology gear. The key, the key innovation here is the use of the off-the-shelf, low-cost Intel 3D cameras with advanced artificial intelligence software. So kind of a fun one, especially in light of that controversy about facial recognition. I think in the a city of Portland, Oregon, near me, I think they banned it uh, as a uh, tool to use for security, mm -hmm. which I had mixed feelings about. But hey, you know, this might be uh, an alternative scanning the uh, vein patterns of the back of your hand. That that definitely made national news when when Oregon was one of the first places to ban it, uh, and you know there are other places that are doing the exact same thing. Facial recognition mm -hmm. wears people out because hey, you can't really change your face. You also can't change your veins. Though I do have to say, looking at uh, you know, and if you're watching the video portion, these are some mm -hmm. of the sample uh, images where mm -hmm. they kind of reduce the back of someone's hand down to the pattern of the veins on their hand. Right. Uh, you know, each one very unique. Um, I, I think per um. How do I say this? Uh, identification wise, like this is not someone's face that we're looking at. This is the back of someone's hand. And even so, the information extracted from it is not really personalized. You know, I'm not like, oh, wow, yeah, that does look like Ralph's hand. That's Ralph. Or that's you know? Ben. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, it's very abstract. It's very unique. Mm -hmm, but at the same mm -hmm. time, it's very. That's uh, a good point. Non intrusive, you know, uh, unlike yeah. a fingerprint or anything like that uh, that would come to grow. My only concern, Ralph, my only concern. Uh, I'm a little overweight. I'm working on it. And a little, I mean, I'm overweight. My whole thing, you know, <laughs> looking at, uh, you know, uh, some of the sample images that, you know, they were using for people's hands. Uh, oh, I see. There's a pretty distinct difference between, you know, my veins don't show up very well. You know, they, they definitely don't pop up. Um, you know, hopefully you want to lose weight. Sure. But I'm wondering that, you know, for people who are, you know, obese or things like that. Yeah, Ralph. Yeah. See, you are not. Overweight. And you look at an old, old skinny guy like me with the, you know, you as you, older, you get veins. the veins pop out. Boy, I'd be a great candidate for this. Look at that, mate. That's a mess. Ex <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ralph, you'd be very identifiable <laughs> for this system. Let's, let's put it that way. Well, then uh, you've got an advantage if you wanted to be a spy or something. You yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two, two cheeseburgers a day and you're good to go uh no and and of course so so my, my whole thing here is that uh ralph what i like about this one like if fingerprints yeah. are still in use and i think fingerprints will always still be in use because they are yes, a unique agree. identifier agree. Ralph, imagine if you were to touch something and then the back of your hand is still showing why you're touching something this works as like a secondary you know kind of uh a two-factor kind of thing you know your well, fingerprint yeah, matches like, and your yes. veins match yeah, it's like two-stage identification when when some service sends me a code to my phone and to make sure it's really me, that kind of thing. Yeah, right. I like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So a cool second concept. factor, um, I think fingerprints are still going to be a big thing here. But like you said, Ralph, just being able to, you know, hey, just use, uh, you know, an Intel real sense. And by the way. Uh, most and and this is actually the cool part uh and you and i are off because you know we worked with intel for so long uh, yeah, yeah. they developed that real sense camera they're building that into almost every laptop that they you know kind of support with intel processors and the Very webcam cool. uh yeah imagine just one day Ralph, just walking up to your computer and just flashing you know kind of the back of your hand and everything unlocking for you i mean yeah hey, it's yeah. possible yeah I love Certainly it. Possible. And again, to your point, maybe it's a two-step step thing. You do mm -hmm. your face, and then it says, okay, now let's do your hand, buddy, to make sure it's really you. And then you do your hand, and it goes, okay, I'm happy it's you. Yeah. Um, very very cool. But of course, of course, in a spy movie or some kind of horror film, you mm -hmm. would, you know, chop off the hand of the person <laughs> and then hold it up. You know, that kind of, but I can't, you know. But yeah. let's get real. It's for the well, all intents and purposes, this is pretty good. <laughs> you know, uh, other than chopping off someone's hand, uh, there's probably <laughs> also. It, 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 well, I mean, you make a very good point, Ralph. But like, also at the end of the day, uh, much like smart locks, you know, uh, whenever we yeah. mentioned smart locks here on the show, like you know, you right. got fingerprint reader, uh, you know, scrambled pin, you could do that kind of thing, and like you can make the locks super uh, advanced and secure and things like that. But Ralph. Even if that's not the easiest way into the house, maybe picking up a rock and smashing the window right next to the door is, you know, like make it secure. It's going to be good, but there's always going to be an easier vulnerability. Oh, sure. And if, oh, you know, yeah. 
if a person's hand is not the easiest vulnerability, hey, maybe they wrote it on a sticky note underneath the mouse or something. Who knows? You know, <laughs> something simple. Uh, story number five, though, very, very cool. And again, I like how it, it, it is very cost effective in real world. Uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, yes. y- you can apply it to the real world very simply. Story number six, though, let's uh, let's do that. And uh, yeah, plenty of time. Story number six. Yeah, this one is a story that you need to really dig down deeper to fully appreciate the science behind all of this. So what we're going to give you is kind of the Reader's Digest top-level picture of this. Uh, Pick this up from two sources, Business Insider magazine, story by Marta Godoyv and Javine Rav. Ravindran, I'm butchering their names, God forgive me, uh, but also then from the Institute in Germany, the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, this will all make sense. The headline is a little bit misleading, but this hydrogen paste has a similar range to that of gasoline and could revolutionize the transport industry. But let's get into the story. I think it'll better be understood. So, of course, for years, the worldwide car industry has been exploring and producing some hydrogen fuel cell-powered cars and trucks. And of course, you know that, Ben. Mm-hmm. And like all electric-only cars, a hydrogen fuel cell vehicles use electricity ultimately to power an electric motor. But instead of relying on batteries as a source for electricity, hydrogen fuel cell cars use a fuel cell powered by hydrogen to create the electricity, which in turn drives the electric motors that turn the wheels, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And one of the key benefits, of course, the exhaust from a hydrogen engine consists of water vapor. I, I think everybody listening to this probably already knows this, but I needed to do kind of give a recap. Sure. But there are real challenges in making hydrogen fuel cell vehicles practical. This has been the holdup, such as today's hydrogen fuel is more than twice as expensive, comparatively speaking, as gasoline. And it costs much more to transport today's hydrogen for vehicles than it does most other fuels. And hydrogen refueling stations are extraordinarily scarce worldwide. Mm -hmm. No surprise. Ha, but drum roll, please. But now... Scientists at the Fraunhofer Institute in Dresden, Germany, have developed a radical new way to harness the potential of hydrogen fuel. They created a hydrogen paste they call, of course, power paste. (laughs) (laughs) The goopy new paste, and if you have the show notes, you can see the picture. It's really funny. It kind of looks like that caulking material you squeeze out of a a grease gun to seal things, right? It's just that kind of gooey uh, consistency. caulk. Yeah, exactly. Well, there you go. Uh, So the (laughs) The goopy new paste made by heating hydrogen and magnesium with stabilizers could be the breakthrough that finally unlocks clean hydrogen's potential, according to these researchers. Now, the developers claim that the new power paste is 10 times more energy dense than lithium ion batteries. And again, you have to dig deeper into the articles, deeper into the science to appreciate that. Uh, And this new hydrogen paste can be stored in cartridges, even at room temperature, making it easy to transport and replenish without the need for an expensive network of hydrogen filling stations. So in this scenario, you'd have a car designed for this purpose. The car would have uh, a receptacle for these uh, hydrogen paste cartridges. Uh, The theory would be something like uh, uh, if you're familiar with this kind of model, I can't remember the. I think it's something like Blue Rhino or something. It's a brand name of a, a propane tank for yeah. your barbecue, for your grill. And you go to the Home Depot and you go to the cage and you take your empty one and you pop it in and you get a full one. It's just like exchange out kind of deal. Mm-hmm. Very, very simplistic. So drivers would only have to swap out a used power paste hydrogen cartridge for a new one and fill a water tank on the vehicle to refuel their car or truck. Now, We'll wait and see if this is real. We'll wait and see. Well, I'm sure it's real, but see how really practical it is. If it, if it lives up to all the cl- claims from this uh, research team, we'll see. But I thought this was just such an interesting twist on this. And I hope I hope it works and I hope it transforms the industry and gives us yet another. Uh, you mentioned at the, outlet of the, or the outset of the show when mm-hmm. we were talking about wave energy, we need diversity in our energy saving. We could have this kind of technology perhaps being as equally important as the battery-based technologies we have today for all electric cars. So, TBD, we'll see. So, uh, fun fact that I know about this one. Uh, Ralph, Mm. one of the first places that the world was going to see hydrogen fuel cells uh, in action was the 2020 summer 
uh, Olympics in Japan. Uh, oh. They were going to deploy hundreds of their buses mm. during the event, you know, with mm. all the tourists and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And they were going to actually use them to ferry people around. And I actually pulled up this article wow. right here. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, to- cool. Toyota. Toyota's one who's oh, make them. Oh, yeah. Look and at that. I'm looking at the screen there. Yeah. 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 And everything that you were just oh. talking about, Ralph, uh, other than, you know, uh, before you make people do that, they were saying that for a citywide public transit kind of solution where you know buses already go to one depot or you know have their certain refueling stations Uh, getting the infrastructure in place for public transit seems to be what they were you know kind of uh you know what they're hoping to do and by the way uh they had right here the company revealed that they were aiming to have at least 100 i'm sorry 100 hydrogen fuel cell buses by the 2020 summer olympics i think that they're still hoping to have it but uh another another fun fact ralph because of the way that these things operate and, you know, kind of how they work, um, I think, and, you know, there was a, there are constantly earthquakes and sometimes tsunamis and natural disasters that hit Japan. Uh, right. They said that in case something like that ever happens again, these hydrogen fuel cell buses, because they're so efficient and they're so easy to kind of uh, uh, refuel, at, you know, just get it there, uh, they would actually work as mobile uh, power stations, generators oh, for wow. emergency services. So if you oh, can wow. get if you can get the bus there, you can have at, you know you can plug it in just like you can any other generator, and mm. yeah, refueling it would be much simpler than refueling, let's say, uh, gasoline that would be in you know short supply during a natural event like right. that. So, wow, uh, cool. Yeah, buses on use in Japan, and then of course, like I said, uh, natural disaster generators. Uh, in a pinch so yeah that's um it, it's 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 already on the road it's already working and now just like the electric car ralph you know 10 years ago you had to start the infrastructure somewhere so yes that's right. where we're at um <laughs> although price does need to come down twice as expensive as gas i would never do that but story number seven <laughs> we'll go ahead and do this one and then we'll start picking through i think some of the stories but you know what you we're bet, making yeah. good time story number seven yeah not too bad not too bad <laughs> okay so story number seven a solar panel in space is collecting energy that could one day be beamed anywhere on earth couldn't resist that headline mm-hmm. uh comes from cnn a story by nick Peyton walsh and again if you have the show notes we've got the pictures the links and all this good stuff here we go Scientists working for the Pentagon. Hmm. You can see why the <laughs> Pentagon would want to beam energy anywhere onto the Earth, maybe to support troops in obscure locations mm-hmm. in the field, right? That makes sense. So scientists working for the Pentagon recently tested a solar panel the size of a pizza box in space. The test panel is a prototype for a future system designed to send electricity from space back to any point on Earth. That's the key. The small solar panel was launched into space last year, attached to an Air Force X-37B unmanned drone. That alone is an interesting thing to check out. The panel is designed to take full advantage of the unfiltered sunlight in space. And the 12-inch by 12-inch solar panel, so that's a fairly small pizza. (laughs) This 12 inch by 12 inch solar panel produces about 10 watts of energy, which can then be beamed to the earth in the form of microwaves. And then once the microwave beams reach the target location on the surface of the earth, they can be converted into electricity. Now, reality check. We're talking about an experiment at this point. 10 Mm -hmm. watts of energy that the little 12 inch by 12 inch guy in space is generating is only enough to power, say, a tablet computer. So get real. But But someday, perhaps, the Pentagon research team believes that they could create a huge, orbiting, miles-wide solar panel array. Yes, we need more stuff in in orbit, don't we? (laughs) Uh, Miles-wide solar panel array in space that may become a reality. So, TBD, I I get the military purposes for this, but wouldn't it be marvelous if you could have something like this that could also, you can direct the beam so you could say, today we're doing this, but oh, there's been a terrible disaster in, I don't know, Hawaii or something. Well, let's beam some Mm -hmm. energy to those folks. That could be really wonderful as well. Yeah, I, I and uh, I guess transmitting or at least sending that energy via microwaves, I'm guessing it would not be visible because, you know, you'd have this giant, you know, uh, beam from mm-hmm. the heavens coming mm-hmm. down if it mm-hmm. was in this in the visual in the visual spectrum um, right. microwaves. 
I, you know, like you said, Rob, not a lot of energy, and I don't mm-hmm. know, the applications seem very uh, obscure. But I guess that's the mm-hmm. point. You know, they were just seeing if they could even do it before they, I guess, yeah, find out right. w- why they right. didn't do it. Uh, by the way, <laughs> I, I had to look up the X thirty seven B. Have you ever seen this thing, Ralph? The oh the yeah, that's why I told telling you in the audience, check this thing out. It's cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's a cool. It's, look. You know what it looks like? It looks like a miniature space shuttle. Remember the old space shuttles? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It looks like a teeny baby one. <laughs> it does. And, and it's very, very small. Um, and I guess it's now yeah. up there flying in space completely on its own thing. Isn't that I mean, nuts? Th- that seems to be the bigger story to me. You know, great that they're testing this thing out. I did yeah, not yeah. know that the military had many space, you know, many unmanned space shuttles flying around in space. I didn't know either. That was part of the. That was actually why I kind of emphasized checking it out because to me it was equally interesting to go, what is this thing? And again, for me, it reminds me so much of the shuttle. Yeah, uh, it, the old it, shuttle. It really does. And by the way, the, this little article that I got from the National Interest here just says that, yeah. you know, the military and the Pentagon hasn't really said exactly why they built these things. Uh, mm-hmm. I guess, you know, they're using them for this project, so we know why this one exists. Uh, in general, we don't really know why they exist in, you know, like, <laughs> Yeah, so I guess it's go. a need to know basis. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. I guess it is, uh, I, and I really need to know. So, uh, but there you go. With that being said, story number, uh, yeah, story number eight. Now, uh, moving on to uh, space planes, and now you have one for organs. And this this is a story that has been popping up sporadically for the past six years, ever since three D printers, you know, really uh, sprung yeah. into the home. And being able to print not just with plastic, but with other mediums, yes, that caught everyone's imagination. And I'm glad yes. to see these stories are still popping up. Yes, yes. And this one's really cool uh, in the biomedical area uh, from gizmodo.com story by Elise Stanley. Headline was new rapid 3D printing method could be the secret to developing 3D printed organs. And sometimes I doctor or modify the headlines uh, to make them a little more friendly if I felt the need to do that. But anyway, you can see the video here. This is really cool, but let me get into the story. The ability to 3D print human organs got one step closer to reality thanks to a rapid, that's the key, 3D printing method developed by engineers at the University of Buffalo. For example, the new process enables a 3D printer to fully construct an artificial hand in just 19 minutes, a task that would take six hours using conventional 3D printing methods. And now the new process is based on stereolithography, a well-established 3D printing method. The stereolithography process the team developed uses lasers to harden liquid resin and jelly-like substances called hydrogels. Now, these hydrogels can absorb large quantities of water without dissolving, and they're used in commercial products like contact lenses and disposable diapers, by the way. (laughs) Now, quickly printing an artificial hand is great, of course, and the video there shows it sped up, I think, what, 150 times uh, speed, so you can see it happening, the 19 minutes happen in just a few seconds. So again, quickly printing an artificial hand is wonderful, but... The University of Buffalo team is also exploring how to use their innovative new 3D printing process for other biomedical purposes. And this is how it ties back to the headline for this story. For example, the team's stereolithography 3D printing method is particularly well suited for accurately printing all the tiny details in cells with embedded blood vessel networks. Now, according to the article, it's this breakthrough capability, which may lead someday to the production of 3D printed human tissue and organs. Wow. And again, there's so much science, so much depth to this. You need to dig in deeper to fully appreciate it. But I I love these biomedical stories. It's just so encouraging. It's... uh... It's a start, and and I I say that with all the hopefulness in the world because you know every time these stories come up, we mm-hmm. we realize just how hard it is to yeah. You know, and and Ralph, is that like the best part where technology has come so far, and there's so many advancements that we highlight you know here with you and every day on the show here that you know crazy crazy advancements and the hardest thing to do is to replicate the human brain the human organ uh the human skin all this stuff that is just natural that we all have going for us uh is so hard to reproduce uh technology wise and 
this is very cool. Uh, they're at the centimeter, which is pretty darn small. Uh, I think it needs to get a little bit smaller for veins and, you know, just all that oh, kind of sure. thing. But sure. um, I had also not heard about the way that they're, that they're doing it, where they're, again, shooting little lasers at, at the goo to um, harden it into mm-hmm. these, uh, you know, this form. I know. Yeah, that it's hand, pretty, it's, it's, that hand, it's so creepy. Isn't that something? It's so it's, creepy. It's creepy and great and wonderful all in one... <laughs> One but, video, <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 really, I I'm hopeful that they're able to do that. Uh, and hey, organs uh, at some point, um, yeah, I I don't know what to say about that. It's uh, it's a good start. It's a good start. I don't think yep. that it's uh, obviously you know next year we're gonna have organs, but hey, it's <laughs> it's possibly something that could work. Uh, story number nine. And hey, speaking of a story that pops up every you know every so often, robo taxis. Oh yeah, yeah. So the headline here is Waymo begins robo taxi tests in San Francisco. I've of driven course. in San Francisco many times. Terrifying experience. I'm uh, not as scary as Mumbai, I would think, but but. It's incredible, the, all the convoluted streets and uh, pedestrians, jaywalk, all this stuff. I mean, yikes. You know what gets me? Anyway, I, I, and, yeah. and just real quick, I, I have also driven in San Francisco just once, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I got to mm-hmm. say that um, when you're staring straight up at the sky because the hills are so steep, <laughs> and like it, it's not even like you know you take a right and you don't know what's you know around the corner. It's yeah. like you're, you're you're like staring up and you don't know what's on you know what's over the crest of the hill, and it could be. <laughs> Traffic, a bike, pedestrian, skateboarders. Yes. Oh yes. my! I hate driving there. But please go ahead. Yes. Well, so that's the point. Mm-hmm. Again, if you're familiar with San Francisco downtown and such, yeah, it's a special driving experience. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so Waymo begins robo taxi tests in San Francisco. This comes from VentureBeat, story by Kyle Wiggers. That's W I G G E R S. Uh, link and pictures here for you. Uh, Mid last month. Google's self-driving car project called Waymo uh, began limited testing of driverless autonomous taxis with employee volunteers in San Francisco, brave volunteers. Waymo says its self-driving electric SUV taxis have driven 20 million autonomous miles on public roads in 25 cities. So they've, you know, put this to the test. But I still think San Francisco has got to be a a uniquely horrifying uh, challenge. Waymo says it has optimized its autonomous planning, perception, and navigation system, which they call Waymo Driver, to handle the complexities of the Golden Gate City. For example, aided by cameras and artificial intelligence, the Waymo Driver system can respond to sudden surprise events such as a jaywalker. And So you've got a lot of surprise events in San Francisco, so let's see. Let's wait and see how this works out. If they can pull off a consistently successful and safe autonomous driving taxi in San Francisco downtown. Wow. The next challenge is Mumbai. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, I I heard about being a pedestrian and a driver in, in places like that. Uh, The number one trick, and that's something that, you know, American drivers just really don't know. Uh, like it's the point of the rules of the road be predictable you know it's not don't do anything unpredicted signal do your thing be predictable and everything's going to be okay ralph if you ever need to drive in in mumbai you know just kind of be (laughs) obvious Uh, like don't make sudden turns or else you will you will have a bad day but i I gotta say that um having this closed well i guess kind of limited launch and looking at the you know kind of uh, waymo one which is the service that will be used to hail rides uh, uh-huh. One thing I noticed, like in every one of these, Ralph, it's it's daylight, perfect weather conditions, that yeah. kind of thing. And, and like even in their product video, I think that they are being very obvious that these things will only operate probably in near perfect conditions, daylight, maybe limited nighttime driving, no rain, no snow, no nothing. And yeah, you know, it, it's going to have to be perfect conditions for these things to operate, but it's a start, you know, it's something that gets them on the road and gets people, I get, and really that might be the big part of it, Ralph, getting people to actually trust these things. I, you know, at the beginning of the right. story, you said, right. uh, you know, people, uh, to test them and you're like brave, you know, brave employees to volunteers for this. Um, that's what they have to overcome next. I think is to get that mm-hmm. trust and you're right. Mm-hmm. They have to earn it. It's, it, we mm-hmm. can't just give it to them. Yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah uh speaking of trust speaking of trust uh Hey, you know, self-driving cars, flying cars. It's also something that we saw out at CES. Um, taxis, flying taxis, flying cars. Uh, they're, you know, hey, they're coming. I guess with the advent of better electrical batteries and things like that. Uh, yes. Yeah. These uh, these things are going to start appearing soon, soon. Uh, story number 10 gives us a better hint. Yeah, this is fun from ZDNet story by Greg Nichols. Headline, Flying Cars Over Los Angeles by 2024. Wow, cool picture too. Check out this vehicle. Uh, so Archer, a maker of electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, recently announced a partnership with the city of Los Angeles to create a, a pardon me, an urban air mobility network by 2024. This will be the first of its kind initiative in the United States. So this story resonated for me for so many reasons. The electric flying taxis will carry up to four passengers with a range of 60 miles and at speeds of up to 150 miles an hour. To help make these flying electric cars a reality, by the way, Archer and Fiat Chrysler Automobiles recently entered into a supply chain agreement. And this agreement will enable Archer to access Fiat Chrysler's advanced composite material know-how and engineering experience. And by the way, as a side note of interest, Morgan Stanley estimates sustainable air mobility will be a $1.5 trillion business worldwide by 2040. So obviously that's a ways off, but there is a real, they think, a viable future for this. Uh, well, and, um, you know, so many other projects, Ralph, do you remember talking about the, uh, the, uh, the boring company with Elon Musk and uh, drilling <laughs> tunnels through the ground to, you know, kind of circumvent mm -hmm. highways. Uh, I feel like this is the opposite side of that. Instead of, you know, going underground, you go above ground and mm -hmm. you ferry people from one building to the next. You ferry people from one side of the city mm -hmm. to the next mm -hmm. without having to clog up roadways. Clearly, roadways, they're everyone's enemy. And yeah, finding ways around it seems to be uh, super important. The video that they have up on their website, which you can see yeah. they're playing in the background, right. uh, gives it's all CGI all computer generated well, right, so right. you know it's uh you know proof of concept but it looks very uh very suitable for quick you know kind of landing mm -hmm. take off take people from yep. here to there yeah uh yeah rough just you know kind of the uber of the skies i'm sure that you'd be able to call one of these things it would probably be more expensive you know uh oh, but sure. hey sure. if you get if, if you get to somewhere fast and you don't have to wait for traffic uh, I can see, you know, that being a very important thing for congested cities. So, well, how about this? I, mm -hmm. I kept my first thought was business people and so forth. But wait a minute, paramedics, emergency teams, if you could deploy them um, without having to have ambulances or trucks trying to go through heavy Los Angeles traffic. If you could rapidly deploy a, a paramedic team to an emergency site or a, a terrible crash on the freeway or something, because it's vertical uh, takeoff and landing, right? Uh, wow. I, I just sure thought that. Ding. I, that was the bell that just went off in my head. Well, and, you know, uh, uh, this particular one doesn't seem to be suited. And, of course, you can make one suited for it. But mobile ambulances, you're right, uh, that could right, be able to, right. you know, that could get right to the scene of something quickly no, no matter where it is and of course hey you know it could even be over water it could be you know kind of up a yep. hill hikers and yep. things like yep. that yep 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 good very point. Yeah. very 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 possible and i'm sure that uh, you know ambulances uh would be a great first uh and, pol use and police if there's a terrible That's crime right. or some horrible thing going on and they need to deploy uh, some special people i don't know maybe yeah, I don't know. Flying cops, though that that's uh, you know that that's sca that scares me a little bit. I don't know why flying paramedics don't, but flying cops do. Um, but yeah, so there's that. And Ralph, we have like one minute left, so let's go ahead and just you know briefly talk about. Uh, I think we only didn't get to two different stories. So what were the two yeah, stories we did bad. not get yeah. to? Well, the two stories, and come out and get the show notes, folks, since we're running out of time here. But one was a a Apple. 
mixed reality headset likely coming sometime in 2022, a leading analyst predicts, a story I picked up from the Virgin Mac rumors. And, and check the story out when you come back and get the show notes. Uh, this analyst is predicting a helmet-like mixed reality headset from Apple next year, priced around a thousand bucks. And of course, if you're familiar with mixed reality, it's augmented and virtual reality. And augmented reality, think of the Pokemon game on your iPhone, where you're looking at the real world in front of you, but overlaid is the little Pokemon characters. And uh, uh, the prediction is that this headset will mostly be a standalone product and not require an iPhone. And also this analyst in the same uh, prediction talked about reality glasses in 2025 and contact lenses, augmented reality contact lenses by 2030 or 2040. Cool stuff. So check it out. That is uh, that is quite a prediction. I, you know, I'm, I'm expecting to hear more about this uh, coming up because Apple, everything they do, uh, Ralph, the supply chain does not let them be secret. You know, whenever Apple orders you know, uh, 10 million, you know, kind of uh, right. screens. Yeah, it, it kind of tips their hand, but I'm looking forward to that. It makes perfect sense. Uh, story number 12, of course, you can see that out there, uh, tiny sunlight powered aircraft could soar yeah, that's a fun story. reach. So there you go as well. That and more. And of course, hey, links to everything we talk about. If you want to go find out more yourself, you can see it there. Uh, ComputerAmerica.com, everyone, Ralph Bond and Ralph, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hey, we'll definitely catch you next time. All right, buddy. Always a blast. Always fun. Always fun. And everyone, of course, you can find more at ComputerAmerica.com. And hey, I thought I'd turn that off. There we go. Uh, yeah. So with that being said, ComputerAmerica.com, we apologize for the uh, uh, the problems earlier in the show. Just found out that's actually not our fault. That's uh, That was Twitch's fault. So it's perfectly okay. Everyone, until next time, have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>